third talk uh, in the session is about quantitative separation logic, a logic for reasoning about uh, probabilistic pointer programs. Uh, the authors are uh, Kevin Butts, Benjamin uh, Kaminsky, Jos Peter Katon, Christoph uh, Matea, and Thomas Noll, and Christoph will give the talk. Thanks. Yes, so this is another talk about a quantitative separation logic to reason about probabilistic pointer programs. So it's a bit similar to the one before, but hopefully you will see that it's also quite different. So our goal is to do formal verification for probabilistic pointer programs. And to put that a bit into perspective, um, we could start with good old Hall logic. But already, if we encounter programs with pointers, this is very quickly a big mess. So here's the uh, quote, I think, that Mark also mentioned in, uh, in the keynote. Um, so one particular problem when doing formal proofs with programs with pointers is that we have to deal with nasty things like aliasing and sharing between data structures. But fortunately, there is this nice extension called separation logic or for logic that uh, enables elegant compositional reasoning about pointer programs. So if we see pointers, we should just use separation logic. But there is the second component here that we are interested in, which is that we also want to do quantitative reasoning. And I have another nice quote here. Maybe I should have taken a quote from Mark Harmon after the keynote. So you don't just want to prove a program correct, but maybe you also want to quantify how correct a program is. So for example, what is the probability of encountering a failure, uh, but also what are the required resources or what is the expected runtime of a given program? And again, there is already some previous work uh, by Cozen, McIver, and Morgan, namely weakest pre-expectations uh, that enable compositional reasoning about quantitative properties of probabilistic programs. So this is kind of the current picture. Uh, but actually, now, if we have pointers and we want to use separation logic, we still want to do quantitative reasoning. And if we use pre-expectations, we still want to be able to reason about programs with pointers. So actually, this picture should be a lattice, and we would like to have something like a quantitative separation logic. Yeah. And before I show you the details, uh, let me just mention a few uh, applications of this. So here's one paper that's uh, looking at evaluating programs running on unreliable hardware. So they are rather low level. It's natural to use pointers. But at the same time, uh, it's also natural to use probability distributions to model unreliability um, or random noise. And another field is just randomized algorithms that typically also rely on some kind of data structure, for example, probabilistic skip lists or randomized meldable heaps. And to do actual formal proofs that these uh, randomized algorithms are correct, you also need a logic that can deal with both randomization and uh, dynamic memory. So the plan for the remainder of the talk is to give you a flavor of what we think is a good notion of quantitative separation logic. Um, first, we have a brief look at the um, assertion language, at the verification system. I will show you a few theorems that hopefully justify that this is a good notion. And then we look at some examples of programs that we verified. All right, so the basic notion is that we uh, have two essential objects, states and expectations. States are just evaluations of variables. And since we also have uh, dynamic memory and pointers, we also have a heap, which is just a finite mapping from addresses to values. And together, a state is just a, com uh, a pair of these two, a variation, uh, valuation of variables and a heap. And instead of describing then sets of states by logical formulas, we are looking at random variables, which are functions mapping states to positive real numbers or infinity. And for some historical reasons, these random variables are called expectations. Good. So for example, if we are interested in the squared value uh, of some variable x, we could write an expectation for that. If we are interested in the number of addresses allocated currently on the heap, we can write an expectation for that. And in particular, for all atomic formulas of classical separation logic, we can also write an expectation for that. For example, if we're interested if the heap is empty, we can write an expectation like this, mapping to 1 if the heap is empty and to 0 otherwise. And we can do the same thing for a points to assertion. So this maps to 1 if there is exactly one memory cell in the heap with address uh, given by the value of x, and the value at that address is the value of y. Good. Of course, we then also would like to compose expectations uh, using some operators. So for example, if we look at classical conjunction, this is just pointwise multiplication of expectations. 
um, and the two more interesting operations are probably the two uh, ones that gave separation logic its name. So in particular, the separating conjunction. This is the classical definition. And intuitively, uh, this means that we take some heaps, say this one, and then we partition it into two classes. And uh, then for one part of this partition, the left part of the formula must be satisfied. For the other part of the partition, the right part of the formula must be satisfied. So intuitively, we compute all possible partitions, and then we kind of want to maximize a truth value of this conjunction. And that is also the uh, intuition to lift this to a notion on expectations. So here you see we split a heap H into H1 and H2, and then we, um, over all these possible splittings, we want to maximize this product, so this conjunction for um, a separating conjunction between two expectations. The other name-giving operator is the separating implication, also known as the magic wand. And uh, one particularly interesting property about this in the classical setting is that um, separating conjunction and magic wand are adjoined. So adding a separating conjunction kind of removes a part from the heap. Uh, using a separating implication, we can extend the heap. Here's again the classical definition. So we uh, look at all possible extensions H prime that are disjoint with the current heap H. Um, this extension additionally has to satisfy the left-hand side of a separating implication, so phi. And then we evaluate uh, the right-hand side psi in the heap extended by H prime. Good. So in the world of expectations, um, implication corresponds to a less than equal in our letters. Um, and we would still like to be separating conjunction and implication to be adjoined. And this leads us at least as long as the left-hand side of a separating implication is a predicate to this notion of separating implications. So again, we look at all possible extensions that satisfy the left-hand side of the implication, and then we take an infimum over all evaluations of expectation G in this extended heap. All right, that's all I wanted to say about the assertion language. How do we actually do program verification with this? So uh, we used an expectation transformer, uh, a weakest pre-expectation transformer. So um, we are given a program C and some uh, post-expectation F that is evaluated in the final states. And then this post-expectation is pushed backwards through the program to give us the weakest pre-expectation of this program with respect to that state. And this is essentially an expectation that maps every final state uh, to the expected value of f after successful termination of this program on that initial state. And by successful termination, I mean, well, we terminate, and it's uh, memory safe. Uh, all the runs involved are memory safe. So we did not encounter null pointer dereferences or something. Good. Let's look at a few examples. So. Uh, Maybe the easiest post-expectation is we could have one that maps everything to the constant one. Then the weakest pre-expectation for a given program and this post-expectation is just the probability of memory safe termination. Uh, we could use something like uh, a function mapping to the absolute value of x and then uh, the weakest pre-expectation gives us the expected absolute value of x. Uh, we could use uh, a separation log log uh, logic predicate like the empty predicate, and then this gives us the probability of terminating with an empty heap, for example, for a garbage collection procedure. And if we have some more involved uh, expectation, for example, one that uh, measures the length of a list from variable x to variable y, this, uh, the weakest pre-expectation would give us the expected length of such a list segment from x to y. All right. So... Um, Here's one example of one particular uh, rule how this weakest pre-expectation works, in this case for memory allocation. So assume this is an initial state, um, and we would like to execute a statement like x uh, is set to new e. So we want to allocate some new address, say v, and the value at that address is set to the value of expression e, and the allocated address is stored in variable x. How is V chosen? Well, we don't know. It's non-deterministic, so it might be one, it might be two, it might be anything else. So in particular, this means here we have to deal with infinitely branching non-determinism, uh, which complicated our proofs quite a bit. So um, yeah, how does this work with the weakest pre-expectation transformer? We want to measure some property F in the final states, and now we want to push this uh, through this program with this transformer. 
and there we have to account for all the changes uh, made by this new statement. So you can see in the left uh, heap, there is uh, the cell with address V missing, so we have to add that using a separating implication, the quantitative separating implication. We also have to update the value of uh, X. And finally, since we uh, don't know the value of this address V, uh, we have to make a non-deterministic choice. And taking a demonic view on non-determinism, we just take the infimum over all possible addresses. Good, so this is the weakest free expectation of this new statement. Uh, we can also look at things like probabilistic choice. So if we want to execute um, a program uh, C1 with probability P and C2 with probability one minus P, then uh, the weakest free expectation for this is just a convex sum of the weakest free expectations of these two programs. And essentially here is the whole weakest free expectation transformer for a simple um, imperative programming language. We also support other things like probabilistic assignments, uh, also recursive procedures. Uh, please do not read all of this. The whole point I want to make here is that this is a rather simple calculus, so it's relatively easy to use this to reason actually about programs. There is nothing super uh, complicated in each of the individual statements. Good. So why is this a good notion of quantitative separation logic. The first thing, um, the first theorem I want to show you is that QSL is a conservative extension of, well, weakest pre-expectations, uh, but also of classical separation logic as in the original seminal papers. Um, for weakest pre-expectations, this might be rather intuitive because, well, we also define a weakest pre-expectation transformer, but what does this mean for separation logic? So if we have two separation logic formulas, phi and psi, we can come up with two corresponding expectations. And well, then if such a separation logic formula is satisfied by a given state, this is the case if and only if the corresponding expectation evaluates to one. So in other words, the assertion language is conservative. Uh, but also if a whole triple with pre-condition phi and post-condition psi is valid for total correctness, this is the case if and only if the corresponding uh, quantitative version of the precondition quantitatively implies the weakest pre-expectation of the quantitative post-expectation. So in this sense, uh, also the verification system is conservative if we would only use classical separation logic formulas. Good, the other notion is that, well, this stuff that we did is also sound. So if we take some program and some post expectation, we can come up with a Markov decision process for that. It looks roughly like this. So if we start in some initial configuration with a program and an initial state, uh, some of these, um, the possible runs from this configuration uh, might lead to a memory failure or they might diverge and never terminate. So we uh, end up in that cloud of bad states. Uh, otherwise, for other uh, runs, we might never encounter a memory failure, so we are memory safe and we successfully terminate, so we end up in some states of the right and then go into this happy state. And then um, we can assign a reward to this Markov decision process, essentially. Uh, every state gets a reward of zero, except for the states where we successfully uh, terminate. These states get a reward corresponding to our post expectation evaluated in the individual states where we successfully terminated. What happened here? Sorry. Uh, and what, you can uh, what we then actually showed is that the weakest pre-expectation of a program uh, with respect to uh, post-expectation and a given initial state coincides exactly with the expected reward of such an operational Markov decision process. And yeah, this is kind of a good operational semantics in our view. Good. Uh, what I want to finally mention is that one of the uh, key theorems about separation logic is the frame rule. So this is the classical frame rule that enables local reasoning uh, in separation logic. Uh, if we choose as the precondition here uh, just the weakest pre condition, so this is normal weakest preconditions, uh, we can equivalently rewrite this as such an implication there. And then we showed, okay, if we now interpret this quantitatively, so again, implication becomes less than equal, and the weakest precondition becomes weakest pre-expectations, uh, the frame rule still holds. So the kind of local reasoning that uh, we like from separation logic also works in the quantitative case. Good, so 
the remaining time, I want to show you some examples. Uh, one particular strategy to re, um, develop randomized algorithms is to first randomize the input and then use a deterministic strategy to actually solve your problem. Uh, for example, here is a procedure to randomize an array taken from a popular book on algorithms. Um, it, it essentially iteratively uh, uniformly samples some positions in the array and then swaps the positions. So the heap manipulating statements are in the swap and the uniform statement is probabilistic here. Uh, and then we used QSL with a relatively short proof to show that uh, no particular permutation of the input array has a probability higher than one divided by the number of all possible permutations of that array. So no particular permutation has a higher probability than it should have. Um, here's another example. Um, we call it the faulty garbage collector. So this is a procedure to recursively uh, delete a tree, uh, initially with root x. But uh, first, as you can see, uh, this procedure checks whether x is already uh, a null pointer, so we can just stop. But this check fails with some probability p. Uh, and yeah, with probability p, we just do nothing instead. And then a good question would be, OK, with is there some bound on the probability of this garbage collection procedure to still successfully delete everything? So our post expectation here is M. And there we could also then use QSL to prove a nice bound on the probability of successfully deleting everything. Uh, the last example I want to mention is uh, taken from one of the papers I initially showed you. So uh, it's called randomized multiple heaps. And uh, here on the left, you can see the essential probabilistic part of this data structure. Um, in particular, I want to thank our student, Hannah Ahn, who worked on that. And uh, there we could show, essentially reproduce the results uh, that were rather ad hoc in this original paper. So here we could prove on source code level that uh, the properties shown in the paper can also be proven on program source code level. Good, so to wrap up, uh, I have given you um, a brief tour through what we think is quantitative separation logic. Um, I've shown you a part of the assertion language, uh, part of the weakest pre-expectations that we use, um, that it's a conservative and sound extension of both separation logic and weakest pre-expectations, and we applied it to a couple of example programs. Uh, for future work, I think automation would be really interesting, especially because this weakest pre-expectation logic is so simple. So if you can find nice, uh, yeah, maybe an analogon to symbolic heaps, which are a very nice uh, syntactic fragment of separation logic, and also figure out how to solve entailments here, there might be hope to actually uh, automate verification based on this logic. And of course, concurrency would also be interesting, as we have seen in the previous talk. Thanks. Yeah, please come forward if you have questions. Um, we start with one from uh, Slido again. So um, question uh, I thought was really nice. What was harder, extending um, separation logic with quantitative information or extending quantitative logic with uh, separation? And where was the complexity? And that's indeed a very good question. I think really the combination screwed us a few times. So uh, for example, uh, there is a very nice operational semantics for probabilistic programs. We completely threw it away because we had this infinitely branching non-determinism and this, this completely destroyed the proof. So we had to do it all over again. Um, so I think we really just, we had problems with both. <laughs> I mean, the assertion language of separation logic actually forms something called Boolean BI algebra. Uh -huh. And did you think about your space of expectations? I mean, it has a star, but you also use the way you define magic wand. It looks a little bit ad hoc, but if we form, a, say, intuitionistic BI algebra, that might uniquely determine the, 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 your notion of magic wand. So did you check this one actually form Boolean, I mean, the intuitionistic Boolean BI algebra or not? Um, I did not check, uh, but I mean, I think you are pointing kind of that we are kind of restrictive there because we only say there is a predicate on the left hand side of the uh, separating implication. So yeah, we cannot do that, but uh, what we did check if we use only bounded expectations, we actually get something like that. So then the yeah, formal notion of quantitative separating implication is a bit different. 
Um, but yeah, this is definitely something that I would like to look closer at. And I think the problem is really only unbounded expectations. Otherwise, I'm pretty optimistic that this will work. So one last question from the uh, Slido. So um, how does your logic relate to the logic in the previous talk? That's a very good question. Um, I think one thing was already pointed out in the questions before that uh, they require a bounded number of steps until uh, so that, so that the program has to terminate. We can deal with uh, almost surely terminating programs. So if, I don't know, the condition of a loop depends on a probabilistic statement, then I think the soundness theorem that Joe showed us before doesn't work. Our stuff still works. But of course, we cannot deal with concurrency. So I think that has to be figured out, yes. Okay, let's thank Christoph again.